Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible is an amazing service which offers a huge selection to listen to, but it is also one of the best ways to make huge savings on 40k audiobooks. The situation with my Audible book club has changed and I'll have a short video on that very soon. This month I'm listening to the Orc narrative Brutal Cunning. If you want to get involved, check it out for this month's selection and start listening today with a 30-day audible trial get a free audiobook and full access to thousands of select originals audiobooks and podcasts included in the audible plus plan visit audible.com slash lutin or text lutin to 500 500 for those of you in the us as always all relevant links are listed directly below in the video notes Woe unto the souls of those who turned from the light of the master of mankind, for truly they reside now with the restless shades of outer night. Heed the lessons they might teach us, for some duty does not end in death. Their actions echo down the ages, enlightening those who would listen, until the end of all things. Across the galaxy of humanity's reign, the threat of worlds rebelling remains ever-present. As if the threat from the Xenos were not enough, there are some planets and their rulers who forget their place. Often this has been precipitated by the shadowed whispers of beings from the warp or their mortal cult representatives here in the Materium. Sometimes it may simply be a disgruntled citizenry who forget just the scale and power of the Imperium. There are endless reasons why it may happen, and very often this answers a commonly asked question. What use is there in creating machines and warriors which instill a sense of fear, power, or terror even, when the forces of humanity wage war against the corrupted Marines, the Orcs, the Tyranid, the ancient Necron, even the Eldar? Surely they would not look upon the forces of humanity and feel what we would express as fear. It's true enough, although the one exception likely being the Orcs, depending just how many Orcs are stood by their side, they tend to be less confident when not in a massive horde. So where might one need to instill fear and a sense of terror even against an enemy? Where might a weapon like the Sororitas Penitent Engines best be used? Well, the question has likely answered itself. One of the Imperium's primary tools in retaining order across the galaxy is fear. Fear of what people may face should they rebel, and for those who do, they will soon feel it for themselves. They will be made an example of. While some forces of the Imperium can seem at times a pale imitation of the Astartes, which is honestly a fair assessment, it's worth remembering that those forces will not necessarily spend the majority of their time fighting in world-ending battles against the most extreme enemies of humanity. These battles are reserved for the most elite warriors of humanity, but there are plenty more within the Imperium itself. Battles against breakaway factions and rebellions will often contain many thousands if not hundreds of thousands or even millions of dissident citizenry, armed with at least comparable weaponry and potentially even planetary defences. So even in the modern age of the Imperium, there are planets that will not be calmed by the mere arrival of an Inquisitor, a deployment of Imperial Guard, a Sororitas ship, or maybe not even by a deployment of marines. Is exterminatus an option? Always. But remember, as much as the myth surrounding exterminatus suggests that the Imperium would burn a planet as quickly as they would make a cup of tea, it is in theory at least meant to be a last resort or used as a means to avert some far more severe crisis like say the spreading corruption of chaos, plague or other alien infection. Little information has been retained regarding the fate of planet Rufanon. This is likely by design, and only one account is believed to have survived, dictated by an Imperial Historatrix of a well-respected Lord General of the Imperium. So what follows describes the rise, fall, and subsequent fate of the Rufanon world in the system known as the Protean Ebb. The Imperium refers to humanity's ancient history, that is, human history before the Emperor, even prior to the destructive period known as the Age of Strife, as the Dark Age of Technology. This was a period of high advancement by humanity, but which now nearly all records and information have been lost. In this era, technology reigns supreme, all colony ships 
had fully functioning STC AI, and humanity had reached out via these into the galaxy with the use of their near zenith level technology to settle its first colonies and dominate any who opposed them. This period was in fact so advanced that much of the broken remnants of technology used by the Imperium are believed to have originated from this time. The Imperium calls this the Dark Age of Technology as they look back now with hindsight at a time of folly and destruction. But for the humans who lived then, it was their golden age, at least for a time anyway. During this era of humanity, many worlds would be colonized, including the planet known as Rofanon. For the humans of this period, any thoughts of an oppressive Imperium of mankind would be the last thing anybody would have been imagining, if they could even contemplate such a thing. Humans of this time are said to have been far more elevated and beautiful in their thinking, more bright and optimistic for the future of human civilization. And for those who came upon the planet of Rofanon, as with many of these worlds so-called in the Protean Ebb, they discovered planets of great beauty and without any especially hostile life. However, these early humans did discover that they were not the first to come across these worlds. They found tall towers made from some material they likened to silicate. They found no other signs of life, but these towers and cities appeared deserted. It seems likely, but it is unspecified, that these ancient humans had come across the Eden-like planets of the ancient Eldari. Unlike the modern era of the Imperium though, their first thought was to not disintegrate these non-human structures to the ground and build directly over them. The humans of the Golden Age were far more advanced in all respects, from their ideology to their ethics, so they instead simply left these places alone and built their new communities elsewhere on the world. But this really is unfortunately all we know of the events around Rofanon in this time. The Golden or the Dark Age of Humanity and the Age of Strife which followed have nearly entirely erased human history both in documentation and physical evidence. All we do know is that by the time the Emperor's Great Crusade arrived at Rofanon many millennia later, they found a world which had not been consumed by anarchy and horror, and instead found a civilized and prosperous world. This was not especially common, but not unheard of within the Great Crusade. The planet of Rofanon saw the benefit and loyalty, perhaps in rejoining humanity at large, although perhaps if they had known the entire picture, they might not have done, at least not quite so readily. But so it would be that the sons and daughters of this world joined the ranks of the nascent Imperium and joined its crusade, which now spanned the entire galaxy. I will note for those who always inevitably ask, if a planet had survived so well, how did they not retain a functioning STC? The answer is, we don't know. Some STC were recovered during the Great Crusade. It is presumed that during the Dark Age, many humans realized through the events of this time how dangerous artificial intelligence was, and this may have been why so many STC were completely destroyed. This may have been more precautionary than it was necessary, because as we have seen since, some STC encountered by the Imperium do appear to have survived into this era without becoming corrupted or evil from a human perspective. For whatever the reason you wish to opt for though, few if any worlds were discovered with active intact STC, and for those who were, they were often stolen into the void of the warp by the dark forces of the Mechanicum. What became of these? Unknown. Feel free to speculate wildly at will. In the more practical reality of human civilization at this time, humanity had to weather the horrors also of the heresy. The world of Rafanon and its people became very committed to the Imperium, and many grand loyal Imperials were born here to serve humanity. Rafanon served the Imperium and the Emperor well, but like so many planets, devotion and loyalty do not necessarily equate to fair consideration in the affairs of a vast galactic state, and certainly not the state that the Imperium would become in the following millennia. Rafanon had escaped the steadily more dystopian and highly oppressive Imperium for the most part, that would be until the period around the turn of M37 and M38, where it was ordained by the High Masters of the Imperial Administratum that Rofanon would become a hub for strategic planning and massive data processing and archiving. Billions of daily reports, briefs, dispatches and so on would need to be received, processed, acted on or archived. So Rofanon would be a central data hub for an entire segmentum. What that means is, Rofanon would primarily become a vast data graveyard. Nothing in the Imperium is ever discarded. 
unless of course something is deliberately erased by whichever branch deemed necessary. So Rafanon would become one of these data tombs, and the Imperium would ship hundreds of millions of scribes, serfs, menials and servitors to the planet, and within the span of a generation, transform its entire society. Fairly understandably, this did not go down especially well with the planet's population, who had also been simultaneously declared arbitrary subjects of the priesthood of terror, and its hereditary based governor system had now become obsolete and was little more than a token gesture of authority. A new high council for Rafanon was created and of course chaired by an official imperial improved commander. This was all a facade of course, the true rulers of Rafanon were now the imperial administratum and they ruled over every man, woman and child. The planet was entirely subjugated to the will of the administratum to fulfil whatever duty or function they deemed necessary. The planet's population was now split, with roughly one third containing deployed imperial administratum and their servants, the indigenous population the remaining two thirds. The populace became unseen and disregarded by the administratum, who saw them as little more than a peasantry to carry out menial tasks. They had of course no rights, no real hope of ever bettering their lives beyond a basic existence of labour and service. Now in fairness, this is not unusual for Imperial planets, but it's believed to have hit the citizens here harder than most, given the fact that Rofanon was prior to this a very lush garden world, and it still was, and its people had always held a more optimistic, perhaps sheltered life than many in the Imperium. So when finally the brutal reality of the Imperium was imposed here, it was perhaps more than the people could take. This was a truly rare circumstance, and an interesting one within the Imperium, in the sense that Ordinarily, the Imperium was for the most part seen to be something of a relatively positive development for worlds who had suffered through the nightmarish horrors of the galaxy either during the Age of Strife or times since. On Rafaelon though, here we had a world where its citizens appeared to have been very sheltered and seemingly not truly aware of just how good things had been going for them. That even with the fairly oppressive addition of the Administratum, this was still probably one of the best, worst things they could have hoped for. In fact, it likely gave their world even more significance and meant that they would be well protected in fact, perhaps even more than previously as a lush beautiful world, treasured by the Imperium as garden worlds usually are. However, its citizens did not seem to fully appreciate this perspective, nor did they comprehend the fragility of their importance. The sheltered existence of Rafanon had seemingly kept its populace ignorant to this brutality of the Imperium and the uncompromising nature of it. Now, had they resisted when the Imperium originally arrived during the Great Crusade, they would have well learned just what the Imperium was all about. But they did not, and so this naivety and ignorance would prove a costly and tragic error for the citizens of Rafanon. A millennia had now passed since the Administratum came to Rafanon, and the date is now roughly estimated at being around 990 of M40. Sedition is not something which simply explodes out of nowhere among a calm and peaceful state. As I've often said, we rarely see a population rise in disorder until they feel their backs are against the wall and there's nothing to lose. Most people are satisfied to live lives of relative simplicity, providing they're housed, fed, and not living in terrible conditions. One might consider another trigger for rebellion against a government or state is when a population feels something has been abruptly or consistently taken away from them, especially when those things have been the bedrock of a society for generations. And so it was with Rafanon. It took many, many years under the rule of the Administratum before you would begin to see anything that one might describe as heresy. But the seeds of sedition had been sown by the insulting way by which the Imperium and its Administratum had imposed themselves upon the peaceful and more importantly loyally dutiful world of Rafanon. Its governing nobility and population felt slighted and subjugated. The dissent stemmed from the council of these hereditary peers who had been relegated to positions that were no more than a facade of authority. They fulfilled their role by day, seemingly bowing to the all-powerful authority of the administratum, but in the shadows and the cover of night, meetings were held and conversations were had. Bitterness was apparent. And these bitter feelings slowly reverberated into the population, who merely needed the sense of confirmation 
that their resentment and fears were justified in order for them to then be recruited to this cause of the disenfranchised citizenry of Rafanon. Not enough time had passed for them to become normalized to laboring as the servants of their imperial masters, and they still felt the passion and desire to live their own lives, trading freely and building their own futures here on this world, and for some even granted the rights to travel off-world. But now, here they were, crushed under the suffocating weight of the imperial bureaucracy, and with every day, month, year, and generation that passed, they felt the need to fight free of its oppression. This bitterness and hatred among the Rafanum population would grow. They continued in their roles, they served, they obeyed, they bowed and scraped a living together. But the council of the Rafanon kept the bubbling rage suppressed, and helped constructively direct their frustrations from boiling over prematurely. The leader of this council during this time was one Kruka Vor. Vor had always been of noble blood, and like many of the citizens of Rafanon, had served the Imperium in its conflicts off-world. He had fought wars against Xenos such as the Orcs, but this did not necessarily enlighten the Rafanon Guard, as their engagements were seemingly focused on planets and areas where they did not encounter other human worlds. This is not documented at least. Vor, however, came to discover the true nature of the Imperium when they defeated the Orc Xenos in one particularly brutal engagement. Off of the back of this, he had expected his soldiers to return home with him to Rafanon. Why would this not be the case? Well, we of course know better. These guard would have been redirected to other engagements for as long as was necessary until they met their end for the Imperium. Very few Imperial Guard ever return to their homeworlds because only in death does duty end. For the somewhat naive Vor, this was a crushingly bitter pill to swallow. He had been gifted the reprieve of returning to his homeworld thanks to his lineage, but those serving beneath him were not. None of them would ever see Rafanon again, and they'd served with both honour and distinction. Who knew instead what miserable circumstances they might have found their deaths? But this thought haunted Vor and enraged him steadily. He had seen Imperial citizens fighting for the Imperium, and when their task was completed in his eyes, they were instead given nothing. Vor came to the troubling and accurate realization that no level of courage, honor, or sacrifice would ever be enough for the Imperium. It fought its wars with the weight of flesh and blood of mankind, and in the end their anonymous deaths would not be remembered nor given enough respect. Vor's realization here was not uncommon to the feeling in fact that many Astartes had during the heresy, that they had fought across the galaxy, but felt there was little if any reward for their sacrifice or that of their brothers, and it is only through the veil of time that we steadily learn they were disturbingly more correct than they may have ever known. But that's another story. When Vor returned to lead the council upon Rufanon, he felt absolutely determined that this world must be freed from the shackles of the Imperium. One might argue a somewhat delusional concept from someone who had presumably seen the scale and might of Imperial firepower firsthand. Perhaps he was clouded by rage and frustration and simply believed his own wild imaginings. Who can say? As I said before, when people's backs are against the wall, anything can seem plausible, even when it makes no sense. Vor may well have rationalized like so many heretics that he was not truly a traitor to the Imperium. He merely wanted to free his world from the oppression of the Administratum. And once this was achieved, he might be able to reason with the Imperium to restore their former state of self-governance. Vor almost unbelievably thought that the Imperium would not allow itself to be drawn into a grinding war and would look to settle the matter quickly on condition his family remain regional rulers. And at this point, he would be able to maintain the former relationship Rafanon had had with the Imperium. As one might imagine, this was not the wisest of plans. When Vor finally felt the timing was right, an order was sent out to the entirety of the population of Rafanon, rise up and cast off the shackles of your oppressors. This was no ramshackle rebellion instigated by a reactionary group of extremists. It was an orchestrated planet-wide operation planned over decades. The Council of Rafanon had been steadily placing agents across various industrial locations and institutions so that when the rebellious and seditious acts came, there would be no opportunity for the Imperials to withstand the crippling blow that was dealt. Each agent of the rebels knew their task, and they carried out their orders with precision. 
such a well-coordinated and abruptly violent action caught the administration completely off guard. Such rebellions would usually only come from violent feral planets, prison colonies, industrial worlds with vast labour forces deployed from different areas in the galaxy, or those corrupted by dark forces and Xenos. But from the peaceful and serene planet of Rathanon, none could have predicted this. Yet none of the Imperials even suspected anything were amiss, until their docile workers were kicking their doors in, summarily executing or violently detaining them for later interrogation, or potentially exchange later down the line. As rebellions against the Imperium go, the actions of the Rafanon populace were up there as one of the cleanest and most well-planned executions, no doubt aided by the seemingly unlikely occurrence of such an action. When all was said and done, many thousands of Imperial officials were dead, quite often as they slept, never knowing who or what had put a projectile weapon, blade or blunt instrument into their head or across their throats. The menial scribes and serfs of the administratum were not spared. The Rafanon had little empathy for those who worked in the halls of the Imperials. Next came the destruction of the halls and archives of the administratum. The rebels were now into a full-blown riot and were destroying anything they came upon that held significance to the administratum. The entire archives were burned and by the morning the sun was barely visible as black clouds of choking ash filled the sky. The entire world of Rafanon was now being racked by full-blown rebellion, violent, raging and unstoppable. Anything that remained of the administratum was in a complete state of panic and terror. It seemed very much as if the entire world would be lost to the rebels in barely a single day, were it not for one man, Lord General Artemis Blythe. Blythe was a heavily decorated military veteran of the Administratum, and although one does not necessarily think of strong military leadership connected with the Administratum, this is exactly what Blythe was. He had weathered many serious engagements, most notably he assumed control of what was known as Army 17, leading an exemplary campaign to scour an entire system of rebels and pirates. Blythe was known for being methodical and efficiently blunt in his orders and demeanour, yet he often would exhibit sparks of tactical inspiration where others might have fallen back on the security of regimental doctrines. Yet Blythe held imperial doctrines with high regard and in fact believed that while innovation was valuable and even advantageous, these were only benefits that should be allowed to those heavily schooled in imperial doctrine and were able to then calmly and objectively weigh up the pros and cons of any given situation. Because of its lush garden nature of a world, Rafanon was often like many garden planets used by high up imperials to either retire or recuperate. And so as fate would decide, Lord General Blythe found himself here upon Rafanon for this exact purpose. Just as the rebellion broke out. Unfortunately for the population of Rafanon and Vor, the reason Blythe found himself here was because during his last engagement he had refused to stand down as command of operations until the campaign was declared complete. So for Blythe, he literally collapsed from sheer physical exhaustion at the point of final victory. Having such an Imperial veteran military commander upon Rafanon was unfortunate for the rebels as they would soon discover. Blythe's immediate actions were to launch counterattacks against the concentrations of rebels known to the Imperials. It would have been better to gather information and know more of their enemy, but Blythe balanced this against the immediate threat and felt it was important to push back immediately. Yet the larger issue was simply knowing who he could count on. He would order what Imperial Guard forces they had managed to contact to simply converge on a series of hastily decided objectives. The aim of this was to try and understand who out of the Imperials here would obey and who would side with the rebels. Unfortunately for Blythe, less than one third would follow the orders. The others seemingly had believed the lies of the rebels. But it would soon be discovered that those who had followed their command were in fact off-worlders and all those guard from Rafanon itself had rejected their chain of command and sided with the rebels. For Blythe though, it was also discovered soon after that more concerningly, those loyal forces to him were not even actual trained guard. They were in fact PDF forces who were largely made up of ex administratum who were deemed surplus and had been redistributed to PDF training camps. They were about as poor quality a trained group as you could imagine. So Blythe coming to understand not just the situation, but the strength of the force he had to work with both in numbers and actual trained skill was deeply depressing. He fought back his feelings of despair, 
and Blythe's only next course of action was to request reinforcements off-world. In such a situation, a senior Imperial commander will send out astropathic requests at increasing range, and within a few days Blythe had managed to arrange a deployment of guard to be split off from a larger fleet en route to a different engagement. They would then come to assist, and gather a larger force from PDF in a neighbouring system to bolster their strength, finally to arrive at Rafanon some 20 days later. Gathering a force for deployment in such a period of time was extremely uncommon, and it was only a combination of luck and the weight of Blythe's rank and prestige that made it possible at all. The coming war would be as bitter a campaign as Blythe had ever encountered, yet he never doubted for a moment that he would be victorious. The only problem was that Vore also shared this sentiment. They were committed at this point, and knew that nothing other than victory would save him and the Rafanum people from a fate far worse than all they had so far endured. The result was a grinding war of attrition that saw every piece of ground fought over, with a fury few had imagined they would ever see upon the formerly tranquil world of Rafanon. Blythe's reinforcements were designated as One Rig, or the first Rafanon intervention group. They deployed to the world some 300 kilometers southeast of the major population center of Rafanon City, where they would come under the command of Lord General Blythe. In the short time prior to the regular Imperial's arrival, though, Blythe had managed to somehow organize his paper-thin force of administrative PDF into a moderately acceptable fighting force. No small achievement. He had selected any with military experience and promoted them accordingly, and then focused on merely containing the rebels, disrupting their operations where risk seemed acceptable. But not wanting to spark any true conflicts, they would have been unable to be contained. After the initial zeal of their raging assault, things had somewhat quietened down, and Blythe kept his forces away from the population centres and administratum complexes. Instead, they patrolled the dense forests in a boreal terrain between the areas dense with rebels. As well planned and competent as this sounds, this was not handled especially cleanly by those under his command, and while they did have some success with engagements, they often came off the worse for it, and Blythe knew his time was running out. So the reinforcements of one rig came just in time. Blythe was not only thankful that the regular Imperials had arrived, but also that they had been readily formatted as what the Corps referred to as a heavy planetary assault group. Blythe later was documented as having some affection still for his previously poorly trained paper-thin PDF group of administrative individuals who had held the line despite their litany of shortcomings. But now the real Imperial troops were on the ground and things were moving quickly. Assault operations began a mere three days after deployment and Blythe had briefed the other commanders even as they were deploying logistics and initial site teams to the surface. Blythe's several weeks of planning were now surely going to come to fruition. Phase 1 consisted of elite kill teams of guard being deployed behind enemy lines to neutralise planetary defences, and this was urgently necessary to prevent mass casualties as the main force would then deploy to the surface. All were destroyed in line with Blythe's schedule, and the rebels robbed of their use of laser defence and orbital ground missile batteries in what appeared to be a catastrophic oversight on their part. What followed next was an unusually rare deployment technique, in fact nearly unheard of. The first wave of assault would consist of mass dropped infantry. What this meant was entire companies of each regiment of the Imperial Guard being deployed en masse. That doesn't sound too unusual, but it was the means by which this was achieved, through low orbit carriers who would position themselves some 50,000 feet or 9.5 miles above the surface. Put that in perspective, Earth's atmosphere is said to extend to only roughly 6 miles above our planet's surface. These low orbit carriers would then extend via anti-gravity generators a cone of such a field below the ship. The troops would then simply step out of the ship and fall at a steady rate, gentle enough that they would not sustain serious injury upon reaching the surface. Of course, some would require rebreathers because of the atmospheric difference and the ability to breathe. But deployment in this manner is rare, both because of the technology required, but also because asking a regular guardsman to just step out of a ship 
and descent to a planet's surface with no means of controlling their descent is quite a big ask. Not to mention the fact that likely no one bothered to tell them that it is critical in such operations that the ship itself maintain its relative position over a rotating planet, and this is hard enough, but that also any undue movement of the ship can cause the anti-gravity cone of descent to wildly move around near the surface, potentially proving fatal for those deploying troops. The movement of the position near the surface could be significant for what would amount to a very tiny repositional movement of the ship itself because of the vast distance between. So highly careful coordination and precision are critical here. An extremely dangerous deployment to undertake, but thankfully it paid off and the first wave of the guard deployed successfully if for literally perhaps no other reason than the psychological impact for the rebels of looking up, seeing three regiments of highly trained Imperial Guard quite literally raining out of the skies. Once on the ground, they quickly regrouped and had secured initial objectives in mere hours, crushing the poorly organised rebels they encountered. Now though, the rebels were well aware of these reinforcements and a fast second wave was being deployed, containing more infantry and also armour via heavy landers. This was only possible due to the quick success of the first wave having destroyed the anti-air batteries for the rebels. The mix of the second infantry wave backed with light armour allowed for then the third wave to be deployed featuring three armoured regiments. These were more difficult and took longer to deploy naturally but by the end of the day the three forces had secured all objectives and crushed a rebel column. During the first night they further consolidated their positions and secured a nighttime deployment of super heavy armour. Finally, General Blythe arrived to take command and from here on would lead the forces atop a Storm Hammer Super Heavy Tank known as the Iron Tyrant. At first light, the newly deployed armour along with his now well-organised forces rolled out. Blythe choosing to lead from the front, he fixed his eyes upon Rofanon City itself. The first day's deployment had been a runaway success. Blythe's plan was simple, crush these pitiful rebels with heavy armour and the might of a well-trained Imperial Guard. This thing would be over before it had even truly begun. Vor had observed the Imperial's deployment, and while rebel counter-assaults had seemed pitiful and lacklustre, this was no oversight or tactical error. Vor had planned this rebellion for years, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He had anticipated that the Imperials would allow themselves to be concealed within the dense vegetation of the arboreal terrain of Rafanon, and for his forces knowing these conditions would well use it to their advantage launching a series of shock ambushes, steadily pulling them in different directions and grinding them down steadily. Vor had installed small teams dedicated tank killers lying in the undergrowth and spider holes which they would then launch shock surprise attacks on the advancing Imperial forces. This allowed them to not only catch the intervention by surprise, but more importantly allow them to target the weak points on enemy armour at close range dealing devastating damage with crack missiles. Scores of Lehman Russ were obliterated. Blythe did not, though, retreat. Instead, the Imperials pushed on, weathering the storm of ambushes. He was determined that they would be rooted out. It was simply necessary. Before this risky choice had really yielded any benefits, though, the Imperials encountered another problem. Vor had carefully concealed masses of infantry during the night into the dense vegetation, and suddenly the Imperials found themselves set upon by huge numbers of rebels furiously engaging them at close quarters. Any advantage the Imperials had in terms of superior firepower were lost, and their edge of skilled guardsmen and doctrine also countered by the zeal and ferocity of the indigenous rebels. Despite this, Blythe's Imperial forces came out with something of a win, but they had all lost their momentum and initiative, and this had been the true goal of Vor. He never believed they could be stopped so quickly and easily, but he well understood that allowing Blythe to smash at speed into their entrenched positions with the full power of Imperial armour was a battle he couldn't hope to win. By taking the wind out of the sails of Blythe, he had bought them valuable time, and set the stage for a conflict which would be far more palatable for the Rafanon than it would the Imperials. Blythe now faced a battle of attrition, not one of shock and awe, and this was something his forces were not prepared for. The force assigned to him was specifically designed for fast deployment and the crushing of upstart rebellions through the use of typical Imperial might. They were not designed to deal with a cunning and well-organised resistance force, 
which numbered in essentially the entire planet's population. Blythe was beginning to realise he would not only be here for some time, but that more reinforcements would likely be necessary, and to that end assembled his officers for planning of the next stages in the retaking of Rafanon. One powerful trait in Lord General Blythe was his pragmatic approach to warfare. He was not a proud man, not too consumed in the weight of his own name to be ashamed to scrap a well-laid plan, and in the case of Rafanon, this was exactly what was required. He now saw the situation laid bare, and that any attempt to fight Vor and the Rafanon rebels on their terms would be either extremely costly, or indeed a total failure. And Blythe's armoured forces, despite taking considerable damage in their first advancement, still numbered enough to last likely the entire campaign, as Blythe foresaw it anyway. What he needed now was hundreds of thousands of guardsmen, and so he sent out new astropathic requests to regional systems for aid. In typical Imperial fashion, and with the weight of his name attached to the requisition data slates read by commanders on neighbouring worlds, his reinforcements would soon arrive. The warfare now became far more Imperium in nature. That is to say, any hope of a short, sharp engagement using elite units was gone. They were now here for a grinding ground war of steady, slow hammering on the rebels. The sledgehammer of the Imperium had arrived, and they would do what the Imperial Guard did best. Consistent, blunt force trauma. Artillery regiments turned the landscape into a pockmarked wasteland ahead of the advancing Imperials, and each side constructed heavily fortified lines. It's not stated in the official documentation of this campaign, but I would make the logical speculation that air, sometimes referred to as naval cover, was relatively well matched and so neither side would hold air superiority. Digging in and fighting a grinding trench war of attrition would make little sense otherwise. As each side continued to attempt to push forward, they were met with heavy fire, and so little progress was made despite the devastating firepower. Flanking moves were also out of the question due to both the terrain and the risk of the Rafanum forces launching their previous tactics of inflicting heavy damage via ambush and traps. The Imperial forces held their own, but they were significantly outnumbered. It's worth remembering that Blythe's force of hundreds of thousands of guard were attempting to take down what was a population estimated at 1.8 billion. Now granted, the majority of these were not trained, not active in the actual fighting, but it still left them horrifically outnumbered, and so for every day's successful fighting on the now sprawling front lines, the losses endured by the enemy never seemed to grind them down. The situation was now the Rafanum populace versus the firepower of the Imperium, and they were well weathering the battle. But both sides were tiring. Weeks turned to months and the apocalyptic wasteland of trenches was becoming ever more sprawling. A year had passed as if it were nothing, and progress had ground to a halt. The sledgehammer of the Imperium had failed to inflict a killing blow. In fact, its energy had dissipated steadily, and now it lay exhausted at the door of the Rafanon people. The fighting front line itself now spanned several thousand miles, and had become in places extremely complex, with confusing bunker complex systems and fortifications. The Rafanon had equally been steadily constructing heavy fortifications both ahead and behind their front line, and no doubt at other locations as well, in due preparation for potential other engagements or flanking manoeuvres. The landscape had changed dramatically, to the point that new guardsmen arriving to take over from those serving on the front lines couldn't believe stories of lush arboreal landscapes told by those who had survived since the initial deployment. For now, they looked out upon a barren wasteland of scorched earth, often punctuated by shattered human remains or half-buried bodies in various states of decay. One guardsman observed how he felt you might walk across the landscape and never be more than a few metres away from the dead. The continual losses had been horrific, as any advance were quickly put down and thousands were lost at any attempt to test the enemy lines. For the Imperial Guard under Blythe, who were now operating in proximity to the nightmarish landscape, who would eat alongside the dead, sleep with the dead spend each watch looking out upon the dead. It was a disconcerting reminder of their own mortality. The loss of life had spiralled beyond what Blythe had anticipated initially. Now he was beginning to think the campaign was so entrenched he might not live to see it brought to a successful conclusion. New Imperial Guard forces were being requisitioned from farther afield and still they were unable to make progress. None wanted to consider alternative options. 
but the danger of such possibilities were increasing with each passing month, as the impatience of the Imperium grew with the lack of progress. Rafanon was becoming both an embarrassment and an unacceptable level of what may once have been considered an ignorant populace who simply needed to be given a stern example of why they must know their place in the Imperium. But now, Rafanon was simply considered a world of heresy. It may well have been discussed among Imperial scholars since, would Vor have relented had he understood the severity of such a reclassification of the situation. Question is irrelevant, as the final actions of the Imperium would permanently resolve the matter. While the campaign upon Rafanon had stagnated, the Imperium during this time had been noting an increased what appeared to be migration of the Xenos known as the Orc. Members of the Inquisitional Ordo Xenos were increasingly concerned as to the cause of this, but their answer would be discovered soon enough. The orcs that were found were fleeing from another Xenos now invading the galaxy, the abhorrent enemy of humanity known as the Tyranids. They had been found to be beginning to consume worlds once again in what would be later designated as Hive Fleet Leviathan. Meanwhile, the Rofanon campaign had been grinding away for several years, and the date is now roughly estimated at being 993M40. The Tyranids are believed to be heading towards the Protean Ebb system, which coincidentally is the system in which Rofanon, among other planets, are located. The Ordo Xenos has been carefully calculating the trajectory of the Tyranids, and they estimate they would be coming straight for Rofanon in the near future. When a member of the Ordo Xenos arrived to personally give this information to Blythe and his command staff, many were struck with expressions of true horror. Fighting this miserable campaign had been bad, but it was at least a war they knew how to fight well enough in human terms. But this abhorrent Xenos, clearly some of Blythe's staff, knew just what this meant for them to face as well. And they fully expected it appeared to have now been a fight of both a heretical planetary population and a nightmarish Xenos simultaneously. Blythe, however, seemed undaunted by this prospect. I'll have them both then, he's reported to have said, grinning grimly. The Inquisitor is reported to have left without a word. Blythe spent days deliberating how to best handle the situation, now tasked with not only resolving the conflict on Rafanon, but also how to stop the alien horrors in their tracks before they could consume an entire system of Imperial planets, numbering in the tens of billions. His solution was typically Blythe. It was objective, it was logical, and it was cold. Lord General Blythe announced his plan to the horror of some of his command staff. They would instead deliberately allow the Tyranids to assault the planet by drawing them here and to the relief of his forces, they would not be on the world to defend it. Blythe would withdraw his entire Imperial force from the planet and leave the rebels to fight the Tyranids alone. This seemed a horrifically bleak conclusion to have come to, and it seemed also somewhat confusing. Had they not wanted to originally secure Rafanon and preserve it as best they could? This was indeed the case. But as usual, Blythe's thinking was far more pragmatic. He well understood that his loyal force of Imperial Guard would hold little hope of staving off a planetary assault by the alien horrors of the Tyranid. His only option to bring both situations to a successful conclusion was in the ultimate choice for Imperial victory. Exterminatus. Blythe's horrific plan was to allow the Tyranids to fall upon Rofanon, leaving the heretics to their undoubtedly nightmarish fate. But as the Xenos were consuming the biomass of the world, Blythe knew this would be the perfect time to strike. He would engage Exterminatus upon the planet, thereby ridding the Imperium of two problems. The rebelling Rofanon population, numbering in billions, and the Tyranids, who during their process of bioconsumption would be at their weakest point, having expended significant biomass to assault the world. As we well know, exterminatus is no trivial matter. It is the final word in warfare of the 41st millennium. When the Imperium declares exterminatus, it is to consign a planet to death and all who exist upon it. This often means the sacrifice of billions of human lives, and moreover, the loss of a planet and its resources, likely forevermore, the latter more prominently in mind, 
the Imperium does not declare exterminatus for any reason. Usually, it's only when a planet has become so corrupted that it is essentially beyond redemption. And this could be a biological pathogen, corruption of chaos, severe xenos infestation, or as a tactical firebreak. There are many methods by which exterminatus is executed upon a world, and I would say if you want to know more, see my exterminatus video linked at the end of this. But suffice to say, usually it is a devastating firestorm which consumes an entire planet. For Rufanon, it came in two stages. Firstly, under the orders of Lord General Blythe, the Imperial Navy baited the Tyranids to approach Rofanon by a series of running naval engagements, and I should note that such a coordinated plan for stopping Tyranids is often not possible due to the psychic shadow the Tyranids project, known as the Shadow in the Warp. Thankfully, in this situation, the Ordo Xenos were able to have seen warning markers in the fleeing Orcs that enabled them to provide accurate information on the coming threat and for Imperials to then take appropriate actions. As the task of drawing the Tyranids to Rofanon, which had been predicted already, but for Blythe's plan to pay off would mean they had to be sure that the Tyranids would choose this world as their next target for consumption. Blythe was hurriedly trying to extricate his Imperial forces from Rofanon without allowing the rebels to become aware of this fact, and also to do so without taking losses. Thankfully, as a well-schooled officer in the logistics of such operations, Blythe was well-placed for this task. He would firstly order a necessary sacrifice via a major offensive. This would be to distract the Rofanon, and even as hundreds of thousands of guard would charge across the scorched plains of the front lines to assault Rofanon positions, significantly more infantry were boarding orbital conveyances along with masses of Imperial hardware. It's fair to say that the situation on board orbiting Imperial ships was both a frenzy of activity but one of more like ordered chaos, as the many thousands of guardsmen were being delivered to the waiting ships hour by hour and heavy tanks being stowed and packed in for maintenance or returned to Imperial worlds. This continued on for weeks, but eventually Blythe had no more forces to maintain the offensive, and so Vor, seeing the petering guard force, felt the time was right to counter-attack. Vor himself would lead a huge charging counter-assault, and for the unfortunate guard who remained, they were crushed under the weight of the Rafanon's attack. Vor smashed through the previously impassable front line of the Imperial forces, and his soldiers were jubilant. They had done it. They had broken the Imperium. Vor seized on the moment and ordered the entire Rafanon defense army to charge out from their trenches and attack Imperial positions all across the trench lines. To their confusion, no enemy fire came. They ran at first and then walked over to the enemy positions to find them disturbingly abandoned. Many felt extremely uncomfortable at this discovery. Something was very clearly not right and Vor himself would see the final conveyances leaving the planet. So Vor, now with his millions strong army, were baffled, but with no other explanation than their apparent victory erupted into celebrations. They were unsure of what had triggered it. Had their defence been so strong that the Imperials saw they could no longer commit such numbers to the fight, they finally decided perhaps negotiations were needed. Vor believed it. He convinced himself that Blythe had overextended his forces and in a final assault buckled under the strength of their resistance, retreating from the planet knowing that failure was upon them. This belief and their rejoicing would be short-lived. The skies above them began to grow dark. Many of the Rafanon were coughing heavily already and soon they were able to see that the air around them was becoming thick with particulates. As they reached for rebreathers or ran for the bunkers, others looked up to see many thousands of spherical objects falling from the skies. Like so many worlds who suffered the horror of Tyranid invasion, Rafanon was spared little of the orgy of violence which follows. The alien horrors cannot be reasoned with, they will show no mercy, and simply engage in ever-escalating levels of extreme violence. The Rafanon by now had no ability to withstand the aggressive Xenos. They had neither the weaponry, experience, or stomach for such a battle, and were quickly being feasted upon by the eternal hunger for biomass of the Tyranid hive mind. Within mere weeks, the Tyranids were observed to have consumed the world, and were steadily now beginning to process the biomass. This is a time when the Tyranids are at their weakest, for they have expended huge amounts of their net biomass in the effort to subdue and consume a planet, but they're only beginning to reabsorb this matter. 
the end result is usually a net gain for the Tyranids in terms of biomass. This is how they're able to move on forward in an ever-ending cycle of consumption. However, if significant damage can be inflicted at this critical moment, the chances for the Imperium of later successfully destroying their hive ships is greatly increased. At the least, it also means any future engagements are likely to be able to be repelled or even halted. But being able to engage the Tyranids at this moment is usually very difficult and very rare, because ordinarily the system will have been isolated and the Tyranids will have destroyed already any potential threats up to this point in time. It was only due to the significant planning through the Ordo Xenos and Blythe that they were able to execute this plan so effectively. A single Imperial ship equipped with fast drive systems and arcane shielding passed undetected around the vicinity of Rafanon. Using the gravity of a nearby moon, it flew past the world unseen by the Xenos ships and launched its single projectile upon the planet. Rafanon was consumed in the nucleonic fire of Exterminatus. Trillions of Tyranid forms were burned to ash as the war matter of the planet fueled the raging inferno. Rafanon took on the appearance of a dying star with only the silhouettes for the Tyranid ships set against it. Blythe noted another successful campaign. He had scoured the world and cleansed the Imperium of both Vor and his dangerous population, whose outlook could have contaminated other worlds were it not contained, and likewise the Xenos horrors. Imperial records note that Lord General Blythe's plan did come at the cost of 2 billion Imperial souls, but that it likely saved 30 billion across the other worlds of the Protean Ebb. Despite the arguable failure of his overall campaign, the planetary deployment of guard forces has been long studied since, and become the default manual for Imperial operations of this nature. Blythe has within the Imperium become even more well regarded, his tactics and strategies poured over and studied by many a burgeoning Imperial officer. For Vor and the Rafanon, their rebellion was not without a sense of irony for their objections to the Imperial's authority had been what they saw as unreasonable sacrifices made outside of their control. So it seems fitting that when all was said and done, the death of Rafanon came as the ultimate sacrifice for the Imperium. Their efforts to be free had failed, and in the end, they served the Emperor whether they were aware of it or not, as every individual upon the world of Rafanon met their deaths. So now I just want to talk briefly about Audible and why it's an excellent service for you to consider getting involved in. As always, I've included some of your comments about why you guys choose to use Audible. Audible is consistently the best value when it comes to audiobooks, and that's more important for people these days than ever. Also, with that in mind, Audible recently released their new plan, Audible Plus, and this is all about giving members a chance to listen to and explore different formats, discover new favourites, classics, or things you've maybe never even considered before. Within Audible, as you can see, you can easily narrow what's available within the Plus category or search within specific themes and genres. The other option is Audible Premium, and that actually remains the standard price as per before, and within that you get one credit per month for an audiobook of your choice, and if that's a 40k audiobook, you're looking at often 10 hours or more of content, but then you also get access to the whole Audible Plus range and all the other benefits that come with Audible. As noted, my audiobook club format is changing, and I'll explain why soon on a short channel update. Flight of the Eisenstein will feature soon here on the channel, as did Valdor, but instead of doing a live stream, and I'll be producing a condensed YouTube overview, and I will include your comments selected from a post on the channel's community tab. For April, I already posted our selection for this month of Brutal Cunning, a tale which is very orky, but not solely focused upon the orcs. It's a good change up from the standard Imperium stuff, and if you're not currently a member with Audible, this is a great opportunity to trial it. Use that free audiobook 
offer. Remember, you do need to choose the Premium Plus option to get that free audiobook offer. So Brutal Cunning was my choice for the month because it's good to have a change up which features a Xenos perspective. I know people are often asking what's the best, say, Dark Eldar narrative to listen to and so on. Unfortunately, Xenos are fairly light when it comes to 40k narratives, but they do appear often alongside Imperial stories. There is of course also the Great Eldar series and I'll have a new post on the community tab soon about this month's choice and as I said a short channel update to clarify the specifics. If you've not tried Audible before I highly recommend it as do members of the community. You can see from all the testimonials I post when I ask for feedback from you guys the audience. You can get involved today by starting your 30 day Audible trial with Premium Plus. This gets you a free audiobook as well as access to thousands of originals, audiobooks and podcasts. Visit audible.com slash Luton or for those in the US text Luton to 500 500. A huge thanks to all of you for supporting me here on the channel and as always I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.